The coastline of South Africa has everything that anyone could ever dream of in a surf destination. Raw, gorgeous natural landscapes, exotic indigenous wildlife, and near unparalleled consistency when it comes to powerful, groomed, long-period ground swells. With only deep open waters separating the African continent from Antarctica, Southern Ocean storms form and build swells that travel thousands of miles before belting a coastline that stretches 3,000 kilometers from Mozambique to Namibia, from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. South Africa has one of the most tight-knit and talent-rich surf communities on Earth. And for this trip, we were fortunate to have a handful of the country's most famous international stars to guide the way. The pride of Durban, World Championship Tour veteran Jordy Smith. From Cape Town, one of the world's most influential and stylish surfers, Mikey February. And world-renowned photographer, documentary filmmaker, and the African continent's preeminent surf pioneer and explorer, Alan Van Geysen. I mean, if you ask me any question about South Africa, my first thing will be that it's so diverse. There's a diversity of culture and people, diversity of waves, and certainly with the food we eat. South Africa is the most consistent coastline in the world. We have surf year-round. There's two oceans, Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean. So I'd say the two strongest seasons would definitely be a winter season from May to September. Pretty much lights up most of the coast, and then again in the kind of January, February time. South Africa's got a varied water temperature. Guys are in board shorts and wetsuits. So winter actually in the Cape's a little bit warmer than the summer. And at the same time of year, Durban's like full board shorts and you know bikinis in the water. You know, you kind of need a mix of everything. It just depends how comfortable you want to be. South Africa comprises an incredibly rich, diverse mix of indigenous African cultures, along with Indian, Asian, Dutch, British, French, and Portuguese. The country has one of the more complicated histories of a continent with plenty of complicated histories. Apartheid, South Africa's version of American racial segregation is still a thing of the not so distant past here, but surfing is helping to bridge the cultural chasms and help foster communities in places like Durban. Today, there are surfers from many of South Africa's indigenous tribes, like a teenage Zulu star known formerly as Surprise. Surprise, where are we walking to, bro? Devon Surf. Why is this place special to you? Wow, this place is very special. This is where I learned literally everything about the ocean. This is where I learned how to swim. Surprise is one of the first generations of Zulu Groms who grew up inside the classic South African life-saving clubs, like the iconic Durban Surf, the childhood haunt of countless South African surf stars over the last 60 years. Surprise, grown up watching him since he basically started surfing in Durban. Absolute character, got a powerful backhand, stocky stance. He's really, really small, so yeah, it's a classic case of dynamite fits in small packages. So how old were you when you first started coming here? Seven, eight? Really? Yeah. We were doing like a race, life-saving race, and I was winning the race like in front by far. And by the time I got to the railing, I just got underneath and I just jumped. Everything was just like gone. I forgot that I didn't even know how to swim. For a second, I thought that was it. Luckily, like the, one of the life-saving coaches pulled me up and then I started learning how to swim there. And is it pretty common for, for kids here to not know how to swim at that age? Yeah, very, very common actually, like, especially like African ones. I think to them, the ocean is just about like the white water, but like yeah. it's actually way more complicated than they think it is. It's awesome having, you know, different people, you know, people like Surprise, who's, you know, obviously his background is more of like the Zulu culture and stuff. Surfing is for more than just one type of person. I used to skate around a lot, and then one day Jimmy just called me and said, hey, come give it a try, my dad will give you a couple pushes on the soft top. And I went out, and it was quite fun, but I was kind of standing up switch foot. A couple of months later, Jason told me to switch stance. I started surfing goofy, and I could feel the board turning. And then ever since then, I've always been interested. Surprise spent much of his childhood here on Hunter Street, the main vein of South Africa's board building culture. For more than 20 years, Surprise's father has managed one of the country's most important surfboard factories, Built, which manufactures Channel Islands, Lost, and other international brands in South Africa. We're here at the CI factory. We're about to see some boards. So Surprise's dad, Jakes, he pretty much runs everything in the factory. Everything that comes out of here is due to his hands. <laughs> runs the show. 
A lot of Jake's family actually work here. Sia, who runs the machine, he's been on the machine now for seven years. I always make a joke, I say Surprise gets the best boards. So between Sia and his dad, they just like, that. <laughs> I pick them up, they go, geez, these boards are light. What's going on here? What's the, uh, I want to get one like that. So how long have you had the factory here? We've been in this premises for 20 years and we've been doing boards 27. Why is the surfboard manufacturing industry based in Durban? Durban, where Max Wetton was from, he was the first ever South African surfer to go to world champs. Thanks to South African industry pioneers like Max Wetland, Durban City today is one of the world's most vibrant surf industry centers and the headquarters for international brands like Scarfini Fins, Island Style, and Smith Shapes. Uh, at a young age, I walked down West Street and I stood in front of Max Wetland's shop in West Street and I said, a dream about getting one of these boards. And one day, he popped out and he said, get inside. So I came inside and I started, he said, yeah, clean up, get the broom, start sweeping, start doing this. I was all stoked. So that's where it all started at Max's factory. Starting with the Gunston 500 and through the heyday of 80s and 90s professional surfing, the Durban surf scene was focused almost entirely in Durban City. Today, the scene has shifted to the North Coast suburbs, which have blossomed into thriving little surf scenes. The Bolito Pro, a World Surf League Challenger Series event, brings some of international surfing's biggest names together with South Africa's dense pack of talented young national stars. What's cooking, huh? Kind of fun. here to link up with Durban's Luke Thompson, Cape Town's Luke Slipen, Sophie Bell and Shane Sykes, childhood best friends and neighbors here in Salt Rock, to get a sense of the vibe in Belito and the North Coast. This is like a little beach town, I would say. Durban's like the big city, which is 35 minutes away on the beach road. Durban is definitely a lot more rugged. It's super consistent. It's never really too big until Eastwell hits. But North Coast, a lot more of a place where you kind of want to grow up with a family. It's safer, the community is super tight, sunny, the waves are good most of the year. Durban to Salt Rock is probably 25 waves, kind of like a mini paradise. High performance, barrels, turns, airs, whatever you really want to do. I'm super grateful because I feel like South Africans, like we're super close, like just going through life together, surfing, um, it's really, really good people around here, I'd say. Hey, Seth. Ruby. How are you? Julia. Yeah. What's up? Most days after a surf, you'll find their crew here at Mi Asai, the Sykes family surf shop, boutique and smoothie bar which has become a cornerstone of the North Coast surf scene. So like a smoothie bowl in, in like Hawaii or in the States is like starting price with 14, 15 bucks. And then if you add everything on, then it ends up being like 20 bucks. So yeah, our starting price is pretty much $6. Do you want the mango groove or the passion bowl? How many things are in this bowl? You got some bananas, blueberries, strawberries, kiwi and granadilla. That looks good. Yeah. Let's go. 
If you're a surfer traveling to South Africa, you can't leave without setting your eyes on the country's most famous wave, the right-hand point break of Jeffreys Bay. To get to Jeffreys from Durban, a flight to Port Elizabeth is a painless 90-minute ordeal, but the thousand-kilometer drive from Durban to Jeffreys Bay is a rite of passage for anyone looking for adventure in uncrowded waves. So we hit the road with surprise Sophie and the Lukes in tow to chase waves through one of the country's most culturally complex and geographically gorgeous regions. This is a very tricky turn for, for the crew. When I pulled off, I was like, whoa, <laughs> three vehicles, three turns. The drive from Durban or Cape Town to j has always been that, that iconic road trip drive. You know, it definitely started off with the Gunston 500. The guys were flown in. You know, you had all these legendary old Hawaiian and Australian surfers coming to surf the event. And then straight after that, there was the country feeling event to get to. So you've got two days between the two events and you get here and you're in the j -bag. Our first stop, the African pipeline, Scottborough Pipe. We're here in Scottborough Pipe. It looks like the swell that we were waiting for showed up this morning right on time, and we're waiting for the tide to drop. Winds and tides are the only things we're really concerned with here. It seems like there's swell all the time. Check the, check the, can you see that rainbow? From Scottborough, we were headed through the Eastern Cape's wild coast, known during apartheid as the Republic of the Tron Sky. The greater part of the drive between Durban and Jay Bay, you go through the old Tron Sky. The Tron Sky actually is a bit of a combination between the Kozas and the Zulus. It's called Ponderland, and um, it's kind of a mixture of the two cultures. And it's very unique, absolutely beautiful. It's still run to this day by chiefs and you know, kingdoms. Mandela's house is actually somewhere here on the right. And people like people actually don't understand how crazy it is, the fact that he grew up here, left, he came back and built a house here, just to make that statement that he grew up here. It's a long drive, 10 hours, but uh, yeah, we had good waves this morning, so it's been a good start to the day and excited to see what Port Alfred has. After Mick Fanning's encounter with a great white on live broadcast television during the 2015 J-Bay Open. His leash chewed off as he shakes this one off. It's well known that South Africa's wildness doesn't stop at the waterline. For South African surfers, the reality of deciding whether or not to paddle out where the world's foremost apex predator lives comes down to a personal gut feeling and some obvious signs to look out for. The real honest truth is that South Africa was very sharky. It's not so much anymore. And for the great part, nine times out of 10, sharks are just inquisitively looking at surfers. You try not to go out when it's muddy rivers with that flow and the sardine runs and in the morning or night, and you just be aware. There's a phenomenal organization called the Shark Spotters Program. They decided that we need to get a place of elevation and we need to have radios, we need to have binoculars, and we need a permanent team looking out for the surfers and the beach goers. It's, it's worked really well. It's, it's saved and helped a lot of people. You, you get the people that say, like, this is a nice place, no sharks. And you get other people saying there's a lot of sharks there. Oh no, the ABG is like, hey, do you want to hear a story or no? I'm like, uh, he was surfing three days ago and his two buddies went in and there was a little dolphin like jumping around acting funny and they're like, oh, why is a dolphin acting funny? And then a 
Great White, the size of his motorcycle, he says, just came like motoring right through the lineup right in front of the harbor mouth. And I thought he said three years ago, and I was like, sick. No, no shark sightings in Port Alfred for three years. But it was three days ago. So you're probably gonna paddle out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're definitely gonna surf. After three days on the road, only two hours and a quick stop at one of AVG's favorite pie shops separated us from our final destination. So good. Wild boar. We pulled into J Bay just as the first real swell of the winter season arrived. We made it. Off the log. Was it comes two days or one day? <laughs> two days. <laughs> two days drive. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Give me that, bro. Two day drive. Thank you guys so much for including me on the trip. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did it. You've been telling me to do this drive for so long, AVG. Yeah. J Bay, first surfed in 1964, two years before Bruce Brown's Endless Summer set surfers scrambling for flights to South Africa. Jeffrey's Bay is considered by many to be the best right point in the world. For South African surfing, it's the cultural beating heart, an international destination, and one of surfing's true world wonders. Jeffreys Bay is, I think it's South Africa's pride and joy. That's the place of surfing in South Africa. Everyone that's a surfer wants to go to J Bay. It's one of the best right hand point breaks in the whole world. J Bay is a pretty unique spot. You know, it's right in between basically Cape Town and Durban. It's kind of a meeting point for both those two major cities to come and get great waves. It's kind of cool because it's like a contrast of both places and everyone's kind of just frothing, just going off. It's everything a surfer really wants, you know, speed, power, flow in a wave. I think the one special thing about supers is the pace that it has. There's a lot of speed involved, which is really exciting for any surfer. That's one of the beauties that every surfer looks for, you know, to be able to get that velocity of speed and then literally put it to use on the rail or, you know, in the lip. This is where people fall in love with South Africa, especially surfers, so it's a really special place. <laughs> Yo, you sound like the driven bike. <laughs> oh, no, totally. So, EBG, is this the main, like, Strip of J Bay right here. Yeah, so Dagama, Dagama Road's the main road that goes everything from the bottom of Albatross all the way through to the end of town. But yeah, this runs all the way to Country Feeling where we're gonna go now and where the heart of Billabong was. You know, the Billabong factory, the Billabong offices, and you know, Sharon and the whole setup. <laughs> One of international surf culture's most important female figures, Sharon Crack started the Country Feeling Classic in 1981, and shortly after brought a budding Australian surf brand called Billabong to South Africa. The queen of J-Bay, Sharon has hosted countless surfers at her home on the point over the years, and Country Feeling remains at the center of J-Bay's thriving retail surf scene. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, very well. 
Sharon to me is like my godmom. She's the reason I got my first start into the contest here at J-Bay. One of my first big sponsors, South Africa's, you know, queen. Kind of one of the first people in J-Bay before this whole town was built. And she kind of like started it brick by brick. Like she started making boardies in her house. Someone gave me a pair of board shorts and I made a pattern out of cardboard. People used to come around to the house and I'd cut out one pair of shorts at a time. So after I'd probably made a few shorts and word it got around, we came up with Country Feeling, which came from Country Morning Breakfast cereal. And that was the, that was the beginning of it. There's a typical pair of shorts. And then those were the first girls' shorts we made. Those like running satin shorts. They were the hip things. We never had finance. No one would lend money to a girl. No, so I was only a girl in the industry. So you know, it was like make 10 pairs, buy fabric for 20, make 20 pairs, and that's how it grew. It's something special when a place like this gets developed and grows, but in a really respectful and well-rounded way. And I think she's one of the people that kind of responsible for that. I'm grateful that places like this are still around, like founding institutions. It never gets old watching Southern Ocean lines wrapping into J-Bay, but we couldn't finish our trip without sampling some of the world-class food and wine that South Africa is famous for. The quality of life in South Africa is by far the best, I think, in the world. The food and, and the opportunities to live well and have space, you know, South Africa gives you all that. And I think as a foreigner or a traveler, rather, who comes to South Africa, just for the fact that the rand to dollar is 20 to one, you know, you're gonna come here and your dollars are gonna take you a lot further than you would anywhere else in the world. To put a bow on the trip before our crew went their separate ways, ABG hauled us up to Cape St. Francis and the Seal Point Lighthouse to experience the culinary genius of Nevermind. We are Cape St. Francis, which is the actual farthest point of the greater Jeffreys Bay Bay. And right now we're about to eat at one of the great new restaurants they have here at Cape St. Francis. Amazing food. The owner, Wesley, they all hunt and catch their own seafood, their own meat from inland. It's really cool. And yeah, I'm going to go see what the food's like here. Ashton, Ashton, Wesley. Wes. Yeah, to meet you guys. I focus a lot on local ingredients, specifically towards here. Uh, the best quality that I can get. I've gotten a lot more into sourcing stuff myself. So like the game, the venison, I hunt myself. So we hunt our own animals. The fish comes from this, these specific bays. We get oysters from these bays. Yeah, I just focus on everything around. Uh, so we have prawns and a bagnetto dressing, so it's an Italian style dressing with anchovies, parsley and uh, breadcrumbs. These over here are pani piri, so it's my take on an Indian street food snack. So coconut tuna ceviche, coconut yogurt, and then I make a chili dressing. We shot a kudu like two weeks ago. So we do like a Japanese style kudu tata. It's pretty good. <laughs> Flavor town. We like had to hustle pretty hard to, to get where we are. That being said, we're pretty happy with how things have gone so far, and it's we've only two years in. That's one of the best things I've ever tasted. This wasn't my first trip to South Africa, and it won't be my last. The country's tight-knit community, the limitless opportunities to score uncrowded world-class waves, affordable, incredible food and wine, all while exploring one of surfing's most wild, rugged, and rewarding coastlines. Well, I could do this forever. Thanks for watching No Contest South Africa.